Welcome to Symposium 11, CF Learning Network, Innovation Labs to Orchestrate Improvement. I'm uh, Mike Powers, uh, co-chair for the symposium, and uh, with Brett Gamble, the other co-chair. I have no disclosures related to this presentation. Uh, the symposium session outline, I'm going to give an overview of the Learning Network. We're going to have three presentations on innovation labs, and then Brett Gowan will can wrap up and conclude with uh, some thoughts about the innovation labs, as well as uh, learning network goals and next steps. So my presentation is an overview of the CF Learning Network from pilot foundational improvement efforts to maturing data-driven innovation labs. And I uh, work at Dornbecker Children's Hospital in Portland, Oregon. And the CF Learning Network is a collaboration between the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and Cincinnati Children's Hospital and Medical Center, um, who have collaborated to bring uh, the Learning Network efforts over the past five years. I want to give a couple uh, figures here on context about health system models. On the left is a schematic of the health system care of today. We have science, we have breakthroughs, at least evidence, but often that evidence is poorly shared and poorly used. Um, and then we have the care given to patients and their care experience is usually poorly captured and not shared back to clinicians. So missed opportunities and waste and harm with patients and communities and clinicians not really collaborating and learning from each other. We want to move towards a continuous learning healthcare system. And the figure on the right shows patients and clinicians and communities at the center with ongoing continuous learning of science and evidence and care and sharing knowledge in a culture of co-production and collaboration with leadership by all. Learning Health Network principles include a shared purpose and have a sense of belonging because we want to bring healthier lives to our patients uh, in the CF community. And we want to focus on what's important to patients and family partners, clinicians and researchers, and system scientists. So it's our network. It's a collective of focus and intrinsic motivation and shared purpose. We want to learn from our peers, and that's a really exciting part of a learning network. You learn from others. You share ideas and skills and resources via commons, newsletters, webinars, community conferences, and all disciplines are included uh, from your team as well as patient and family partners as mentioned. Data is really important to improve, and so we want to collect some local and network data. We want to be transparent. We want to share our data with others because data is for learning. Other principles include building relationships and partnerships through co-production and co-design. So this is building relationships with patients and families and your team members. And that's done through shared storytelling and connecting with people as individuals. We want that enabling structure at the local level. Uh, so you have teamwork and diverse roles and independent leadership for all leaders. We want that structure also at the network level to support our infrastructure. We have a philosophy of all teach, all learn. We're all learning from each other. And we teach QI to our patient and family partners where they can participate and lead some of these efforts as well. Learning networks provide an opportunity of real world research and also clinical research opportunities. And all of our work needs to integrate equity goals and reduce health disparities. And we need to come up with measurements to reduce those disparities as well, measurements that we can then approve upon. And again, so that uh, Brett Gow will comment on that uh, in the last presentation as well. This is a great summary slide from Armand Shah's recent article on learning health systems. And again, it re-emphasizes we need a shared purpose, a shared language, autonomy at the local level, but and collective leadership at the network level as well as the local level and having those connections and relationships. And we need those data and measurements to understand variation. The CF Foundation started quality improvement efforts uh, nearly 20 years ago because of variation in care. And we need that infrastructure to support the learning system. So the CF Learning Network uh, was developed to advance the care model beyond the traditional chronic care model uh, in 
the vision was that uh, we could learn from every interaction between clinicians and patients and, and scientists as well. And so there's a design phase in 2014 to 2015. There is a pilot phase from 2016 to 2018 that onboarded two waves of teams. And then there was a third uh, wave that was onboarded during what's called color implementation phase. And that's where we are currently. Uh, the Learning Network is funded by a grant uh, from the CF Foundation and executed by faculty and operations staff at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. So we belong to a community of networks as well. Uh, so we're at the CF Learning Network as our Twitter handle, supported by the CF Foundation, but there's several other um, mostly pediatric focused learning networks, but uh, the goal is to expand into adult diseases just like we are an adult and a pediatric disease. And so that's a goal uh, nationally to increase the number of learning health networks. So healthier together, learning from each other, we can learn from other networks. So as of 2021, the Learning Network uh, is, as we mentioned, a group of clinicians, patients, and families. We're representing about 15% of the CF programs. There's currently 36 programs in our network, and we care for about 24% of the people in the CF Foundation Patient Registry. And you can see representations here from the variety of centers across the country. The goal for our network is to distribute the leadership and that's part of um, engaging people where we all can be leaders. And leadership accepts the responsibility to enable others to achieve that shared purpose in the face of uncertainty. What does that mean, in the face of uncertainty? It means that we're learning. We don't know the answers. And again, it's grounded in the values of that common interest, common shared purpose to improve the lives of CF patients. And it's built through relationships. The figure on the right is the snowflake model of leadership where all can be leaders. And it's quite in contrast to a hierarchical approach or a top-down approach. A top-down approach tends to inhibit engagements from the team members. So our network leadership is led by a team of uh, 10 individuals. This time, we just onboarded two additional members, but we have uh, two patient partners and two parent partners as part of our team, uh, Dave Davison and John Flath and Brett Gamble and Lindsay DeVoe. The figure on the right shows a concept of leadership that we've developed over the last two years called the triad, where you want physician champions, you want engaged patient and family partners as part of your quality improvement team. And ideally, you have at least two people as part of your QI team. And then you have a local quality improvement leader as well. Often uh, the clinician, uh, clinic coordinator, but often not. Sometimes it's a social worker. Sometimes it's a dietitian. We have a couple of programs that have parent partners as the quality improvement leader. And someone to help organize meetings, collect data, communicate with the network. So the CF Learning Network utilizes the model for improvement for learning. Again, the model is there on the left, and I'm going to go into more details in a few slides on that. And it was developed by the Associates in Process Improvement. And what we focused on in the last five years is listed on the right. Uh, the first uh, three years, we focused on the chronic care model curriculum, where we looked at CF program level co-production, collaborative agenda setting for clinic visits, as well as timely data entry. And over the last two years, we've been focusing on these innovation labs, which we'll share with you today. So the chronic care model is a model that was developed to enhance the care of patients with chronic disease. And we've adapted it uh, for the CF Learning Network uh, using our efforts of timely data, co-production, and pre-visit planning to improve productive interactions at the clinic visit. And that's the goal of the chronic care model. That can be done by preparing the patient and preparing the team. And it's that interdisciplinary care and that engaged team. If everyone's engaged in QI, everyone's engaged in improving the care for the patients. And the goal is to have improved outcomes. So what is co-production, co-design? It is people with CF, clinicians and researchers collaborate as equal and reciprocal contributors to produce information and knowledge and know-how to improve healthcare and health outcomes. And again, it's that lived experience by the patient and family and the disease knowledge expertise by the care team overlapping to co-produce enhanced care and improved outcomes.
And there's different levels of co-production. There can be the individual co-production at the clinic level where you're pre-visit planning and shared decision-making. It can be at the program level through quality improvement, involvement of patients and family partners, as well as advisory boards. It could be at the network level as noted by our network leadership team or at the cross network level where we can learn from other networks. Co-production, as I mentioned previously, pioneering is part of co-production. And you want to review important data prior to the clinic visit. You want to obtain information to the, and provide information to the patient prior to the visit. And you want to coordinate testing prior to the visit if needed. And then you want to identify any resources that are needed prior to the visit. Think about patients traveling from distance that need hotel rooms or gas cards or other help. And then the team should huddle prior to the clinic and review those patient preference and goals. If the patient or fam doesn't uh, do the pre-visit planning, uh, some of our teams have developed a day of visit form to, to obtain some of this information. The other aspect of um, co-production could be shared agenda setting and the concept of what matters to you, what matters to you as the patient. And this has been uh, supported by the outstanding CF foundation program, partnership enhancement program, many of the CF Learning Network teams have incorporated that into our processes. Uh, and a shout out to the Academy of Communication and Healthcare. They partner with the foundation. I highly recommend the, this book, Communication Rx. So the model improvement is a model of, that allows us to try and learn a uh, method. It's a tool and it's a framework to plan things, test things, evaluate ideas, and it helps turn ideas into actions. And again, the three questions for the model are, what are you trying to accomplish? So what's the purpose or the aim that you're trying to make? What are your goals? And then how will you know there's a change? That implies you have to develop measurements and collect data. And then what changes can we make that will result in improvement? Those are the interventions. Those are the change ideas that you're going to test. And you're going to test those in the plan, do, study, act process um, that um, helps test some of these ideas. You collect the data where things improved. You can adapt your ideas and you can modify them. And you have cycles of testing and cycles of learning. This uh, <clears throat> diagram was developed at the James Anderson Center uh, for Health Systems Excellence at Cincinnati Children's. And it's a, it's a great slide showing sort of how you incorporate some of those questions into the actual process of improvement. So what are we trying to accomplish? Here is trying to develop, understand your plan, your scope, your current state, some tools to, to develop those uh, that information, how we know that a change is an improvement, define your goals and measures, how we, can we make those change, whether those change ideas, develop your theory improvement and using some tools such as a key driver diagram or, or a wish, uh, excuse me, a fishbone. Um, and then how do we test those uh, with a plan, do, study, act implementation? And we hope that we can sustain these improvements over time. So why this model of improvement? I saw this figure at the IHI forum and it just struck me. This is what the why the model of improvement. You have ideas, you do them together, you use data, and you do it with your heart. You have the intrinsic motivation to improve the lives of CF patients. So what is an innovation lab? Well, an innovation lab is a multi-center collaborative strategy to identify interventions of the best practices for improving outcomes. So it's a collaborative between multiple centers, sort of like a network, but it's, it's also a place to test best practices if they exist or discover innovations to change those outcomes. So we wanna test and learn to find the best practices. It's not an opinion, it's not an expert opinion, it's actual data collection and finding the best practice based on testing. And again, if the intervention is effective, you want to increase the reliability at least up to 80% of that intervention that will improve the outcome measure. So how are these innovation labs organized and designed and how have we used them in our learning network? Well, there's initially a design meeting, which is a collection of co the co-leaders of the innovation lab, quality improvement consultants, contact experts, and patient and family partners. 
where they develop goals and smart aims and data collection plans and theory of change. Once that's evolved, then there's an ask for the network teams to join a, a learning lab or an innovation lab, it's called in our network, and you can opt into the lab. We've had where we've had um, a couple of the labs have had 10 teams and the telehealth uh, innovation lab had over 20 teams join because of the pandemic and the need for learning about telehealth. So during the innovation lab itself, that takes over approximately six to 12 months, you test, you learn, you share ideas with each other, and then you hopefully can show reliable change with your efforts. We hope to spread those ideas to the CF Learning Network programs that did participate in the lab, and then eventually to all centers in the community of CF Care Center Networks. We've launched three innovation labs, and we're gonna share the details in subsequent talks in the symposium. So why this improvement strategy, okay? And again, it aligns improvement um, that promotes learning together and spreading ideas more efficiently. In a smaller group, uh, representatives can move a lot faster than an entire network. And the methodology can work, has worked over time after time with other networks. And again, it helps the teams really prioritize. You are focused on this uh, innovation lab. And then it provides a, uh, uh, frontline providers can lead this work. So we've had a nurse coordinator lead one of the labs. We've had a social worker lead the Health Related Quality of Life Lab. And we've had a nurse practitioner lead the FE1 indicated exacerbation signal lab. And again, so people can be involved, people can lead. And again, it's the rhythm of the work where we have weekly huddles or bi-weekly huddles. We share data, we share PDSAs. We learn from each other. We find the practices that give the best results and we share those with other teams. So the value, as I just mentioned, is we had this infrastructure and support in testing in, in the time of COVID. And we created a pace of work and rigor of work and we held people accountable. But again, um, people joined because they wanted to learn and improve. And, um, you know, and people contributed data as able. And we understood that and we provided an understanding gray stream of the pandemic. We also learned that we do this as a network, but also there's local context and there's no right answer. And there's different answers at different centers depending on their local circumstances. So um, the rest of the symposium, uh, Dana Albin will present innovation lab data and outcomes from the telehealth lab. Uh, Clement Wren will present FV1 indicated exacerbation signal. Jordan Dunnitz will present health related quality of life. And then Brett Gowan will present sort of a wrap up the innovation labs as well as sort of future goals for the CF Learning Network and what's the next steps for our network. We're going to conclude with a question and answer uh, session for the symposium live. And so hopefully we can answer additional questions uh, for you. I'd really like to thank all the contributors to the CF Learning Network, uh, the Cincinnati Children's Principal Investigator, Michael Said, and faculty, Ruth Amin, Maria Brito, been critical to the success of the CF Learning Network, and tremendous support for the CF Foundation, Kathy Sabados, Bruce Marshall, Al Farrell, Chris Petrin, Alex Ebert, the, the operations team that supports us, Sophia Thurman, Sophia Stamper, Lindsay Hoiberg, Sarah Noyes, Julia Conroy, my partner, Brett Gamble, who's the other CF learning co-chair. She has, she's a parent of a child with CF. And we couldn't do this without their quality improvement consultants. During the pilot phase, we had Karen Zerby and George Thal. In the implementation phase, we've had Lucretia Thomas, Paige Crack, Sarah Gomez, Anna Salidas, and Aaron Dawson with Lucretia Thomas as our lead at this time and my own local team, the OHSU Dornbecker QI team, plus my parent partners, Lindsay DeVoe and Megan Weil. Can't do it without you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dana Alban. I am the adult um, cystic fibrosis program medical director at UVA. 
Our team joined the CF uh, Learning Network in 2016, and I have been a member of the network leadership team since 2019. In 2020, I was invited to be one of the co-leaders of the Telehealth Innovation Lab with Dr. Powers. I am going to talk today about Telehealth Innovation Lab, and I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. The work I will present today was supported by CFF and CFLN, CF Learning Network and CF Foundation. As Mike Powers mentioned in his talk, an innovation lab comprises um, a subgroup of programs interested in learning and innovating in a specific domain. Participating centers are provided the QI tools and resources to collaborate and create new processes that are then shared between the participating teams, tested and refined with the goal of an iLab being to creatively design or redesign systems or processes to achieve a positive impact. In our case, to achieve a positive impact in CF patient care through telehealth. All CFLN iLabs consist of several phases, pre-design, design, launch, rapid testing, and spread to the network. In context of the pandemic, the CFLN pivoted the CFLN Telehealth Innovation Lab in a significantly shorter time than the regular iLab time to promote fast collaboration and learning between participating teams. In approximately two weeks, the iLab moved from pre-design to launch and rapid testing. Usually, this process lasts up to three months. Based on the model for improvement, during the design phase of the telehealth iLab, network leadership team members along with telehealth experts from UVA OHSU served as the design team and developed a global aim, specific aims, a high level process map, an SFMEA, key driver diagrams, and interventions. This slideshow illustrates the model for improvement graph, which guides the QI philosophy and the telehealth iLab work. When asking the question, what are it are, what are we trying to accomplish? We decided that we would like to increase the percent of virtual visits with interdisciplinary co-produced care from 60% to 95% by December 31st, 2020, and increase the percent of virtual visits in which patients and families participate in shared agenda setting from 52% to 85% by December 31st, 2020. How will we know that a change is an improvement? We decided to measure the percentage of virtual visits with at least one discipline other than the provider and nursing staff diet participated in the clinic visit and percentage of virtual visits with an agenda setting. The global aim of the telehealth iLab was to deliver co-produced interdisciplinary CF care that included telehealth visits during the COVID-19 pandemic. During the design phase, a process map was created by the iLab co-lead team. During the rapid testing phase, iLab participating CF teams shared tools via a collaborative platform and during huddles, including process maps created at the local level based on the local environment. This is a universal process map created specifically for the change package by the change package writing group. The process map starts with the visit schedule and ends with the end of the telehealth session. I would like to point out that communication is very important during telehealth and the words communication communicate repeat four times in this process now. In addition, pre-visit planning, co-production, agenda setting, and patient education, preparation, preference, and needs place the patient in the center of the telehealth visit. 
telehealth visits are the best example of co-produced patient-centered care. This slide shows the SFMEA created by the iLab college team. Similarly to the process map during the rapid testing phase, iLab participating CF teams created local SFMEA charts based on their local environment. The first telehealth iLab intervention was to create a process to provide interdisciplinary CF care through telehealth and monitor percent of virtual visits that provided interdisciplinary care. The IDC key driver diagram identified IDC communication, prepared team and tools and resources for virtual IDC care as main, main drivers for IDC. The second telehealth iLab intervention was to develop an agenda setting process for the CF telehealth visits and monitor percentage of visits in which the patient and family participated in setting the agenda. The main drivers identified were related to team ability to value input from patients, team and patient communication, preparedness for the visits, tools and resources for co-production of care, collection of telehealth patient feedback, and post-visit wrap-up. Team participation and engagement. 29 of the 39 CF learning network teams enrolled in the iLab. Teams submitted an average of 1.4 PDSAs per week. iLab co-leader and team meetings for shared learning were held on weekly and bi-weekly basis. Red cap data was collected, analyzed, and shared with the iLab teams weekly. Bi-weekly virtual huddles were organized to facilitate the collaborative process. BDSAs were suggested during the huddles to promote shared learning and improvement. Teams able to execute processes at 80% reliability presented their work in the virtual huddles to benchmark learning. Teams shared tools created at the local level via huddles and in collaborative platform. At the beginning of the pandemic, multiple centers experienced difficulties related to discipline access in telehealth. Some of the barriers to, to team access being care team member access to technology, licensing issues, furloughs, and layoffs. Access to disciplines is an important part of interdisciplinary care and co-production of care as during agenda setting, patients are encouraged to ask if they like to see specific team members during their visit. By July 2020, most centers participating to the telehealth iLab reported access to all disciplines. In this graph, one can see that data collection started April 19, 2020, and reliability of center access to disciplines were achieved by August 2020. Teams participating to the telehealth iLab were asked to track and report data related to interdisciplinary care visits. An IDC or interdisciplinary care visit was defined as an encounter with a provider and at least one other discipline. The provider could be a physician or advanced practice provider or a nurse. By the end of 2020, the lab achieved reliability with 80% of the visit being interdisciplinary. This was slightly below the goal of 95%, but significantly increased compared to pre-I lab data at 60%. By April 2021, 100% of the visits were interdisciplinary. Teams participating to the iLab were asked to track and report data related to agenda setting. Agenda setting was defined as an agenda set with the patient prior to the, the day of the visit before the entire team interacted with the patient. Agenda setting included patients' preference on interactions with care team members. By the end of 2020, the lab achieved reliability with 95% of the visits encompassing agenda setting. This is above the goal of 85% and significantly higher than the start percentage at 52%. 
By April 2021, 100% of the visits included agenda setting. The iLab is currently in its last phase of spread. During this phase, a change package team of volunteers collaborated to create a change package. A change package is like a roadmap that guides you along routes that others have found successful. Clinical teams can use change ideas to improve specific processes in their practice. Change packages offer a set of specific and actionable ideas for changing a process. These change ideas are based on evidence from literature, research, and experience of others. Change packages include background material, a summary of evidence or best practices, specific tools, strategies, and examples to improve work. It is refined over time by testing strategies with patients, families, and clinicians in practice. How should a change package be used? The change package was introduced to the larger CFLN and shared with the teams who did not participate in the iLab at the CFLN Spring Virtual Community Conference. A change package offers a starting point to jumpstart improvement efforts. Teams were urged to select a broad array of change strategies and tools from within the change package. In summary, Telehealth iLab was very successful in achieving reliability, providing interdisciplinary and co-produced telehealth care, which included agenda setting during the COVID-19 pandemic. Key to success, CFQI teams with expertise in CF, existing CFLN infrastructure that allowed pivoting the iLab, strong leadership team, frequent data collection, testing and sharing between teams, safe space for sharing tools and processes between teams. Challenges identified, staff, staff shortage during the pandemic, patient access to remote monitoring and technology, staff access to technologies. I would like to acknowledge and thank the leadership support group for all their help and also the telehealth participating teams, we couldn't have achieved everything we achieved without their continuous um, sharing and um, enthusiastic support during the telehealth iLab. I would like to acknowledge Lakrisha Thomas, Clifford Gammon, Lindsay Hoberg, Sophia Stemper, and Sophia Thurmond, for their support during the telehealth iLab. The design panel, CFLN team and consultants. And the change package writing team, John Flat, Masha Farsad, Lauren Ahrens, Lauren Mitchell, Lily Mies, Newman Chaudhry, and Kathy Ennox, as well as the CF Foundation for their continuous support to the CF teams and continuously promoting innovation in patient care. I would also like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Hello, I'm Clement Wren from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and I'd like to thank Mike and Breck for inviting me to speak and all of you for watching. I have no relevant disclosures for this presentation. So CF pulmonary exacerbations are acute or subacute episodes of worsening respiratory status. And decreased FEV1 is a common feature of pulmonary exacerbation. PEX themselves are associated with lower future lung function and shortened survival. Despite these observations, registry analyses show that between 15 to 30% of encounters with an FEV1 decline of 10% or more from baseline are untreated. Therefore, there's a need to improve recognition and treatment of FEV1 decline uh, in people with CF. So to address this problem, we first of all developed a metric called the FEV1 Indicated Exacerbation Signal, or FIES. And FIES is defined by, based on a person's baseline FEV1. 
And baseline FEV1, in turn, is defined as the mean of the two highest FEV1 measurements in the preceding 12 months. We chose this way so to mitigate the potential effects of outliers. So for people with CF whose baseline percent predicted FEV1 is greater than for 50%, FIS is defined as a relative decrease by 10% from baseline. And we chose this threshold because that's the normal variation of FEV1. So if you have a change in FEV1 for more than 10%, it's probably not just random variation. For people with CF whose baseline uh, FEV1 is less than or equal to 50% predicted, FIS is defined as an absolute decrease by five or more percentage points. It's important to note that FIES is not the same thing as pulmonary exacerbation. FEV1 may be decreased for reasons other than pulmonary exacerbation, such as asthma. And we also know that pulmonary exacerbations are frequently diagnosed even without a de decline in FEV1. However, FIES represents a significant lung function decline that may signal a pulmonary exacerbation and should lead to further assessment about it. And that's why we called it a signal. I mentioned earlier that there's variation in treatment of FEV1 declines. And we see the same pattern when we look at FIES. So in this slide, every bar represents one of the pediatric, adult, or affiliate CF programs in the care center network. And the vertical axis here shows the percentage of FIS events at that CF center um, that were treated. And as you can see, there's tremendous variation with over here on the left, some centers treating 100% of FIS events. And over here on the far right, centers that are treating less than 50% of them. Again, this is what's recorded in the registry, so there may be things going on that we're not capturing, but nonetheless, it's clear that there's tremendous variability. The orange bars represent uh, care programs that are in the learning network, and you can see that even within the CFLN, there's tremendous variation. So the objectives and our aims of the FIES lab are as follows. Our global aim was to decrease the rate of FEV1 decline. And our SMART aims were to, number one, increase the percent of patients assessed for FIES from whatever the baseline percentage was to 95% by June of 2021. Number two, increase the percent of patients with FIES scheduled for earlier follow-up from, again, whatever the baseline was to 80%. And finally, increase the use of an FIES shared decision-making tool from 0% to 50% by June of 2021. This slide shows the timeline of our iLab. So a little over two years ago, we met for a design day. And following the design day and throughout the fall of 2019, we engaged in planning and team recruitment. In January of 2020, we launched the FIS iLab kickoff. Of course, a few months after that, we had the COVID-19 pandemic, which obviously disrupted clinical care uh, throughout the, the country. So we sort of had to take a break and regroup and we relaunched the iLab in June of 2020 um, and finished uh, this past June. This is the key driver diagram for the iLab. Over here on the left are our SMART aims and global aim. And then we identified key drivers as well as interventions to uh, enact those key drivers. And after doing this, we then focused on the interventions that we thought would be most feasible and have the highest impact. And those are the ones that are outlined here in green. This slide shows the FIS iLab teams. We had 11 CF centers, three of which shown in green were adult CF programs, the remainder were pediatric. I've also marked with an asterisk the centers that were able to participate in the shared decision-making aim, because not all the teams were able to get to that third aim. This table shows the characteristics of the iLab teams and compares them to the learning network and the total care center network. One thing is that there were 
800, 1,847 patients followed within the ILAB, so a relatively large number. And for the most part, the clinical features and demographics were similar to the care center network. Of course, we had fewer adult programs, so naturally we had fewer adult patients in the iLab, and the mean FEV1 was slightly higher than the entire uh, care center network because of that. So one of the things we wanted to do in our iLab, in addition to recognizing FIES, was to develop a uniform approach towards management. And to do this, we adapted the algorithm developed by Mike Schechter that he reported on um, a few years ago in JCF. The algorithm is shown here on the right. Some of the key features include color-coded zones based on FEV1. So for example, if a patient's FEV1 was stable and unchanged from baseline, that'd be the green zone. Yellow zone was a slight increase or decrease, excuse me, in FEV1, and red meant um, a decrease of 10% or more. So that meant essentially that the red zone was an FIES. For those uh, patients in the red zone, the algorithm incorporated antibiotic prescription and earlier follow-up within four to six weeks. As I mentioned, we also developed a, um, a shared decision-making tool, and that's shown um, in this slide here, um, where there were different options, um, and then sort of the considerations, the pros and cons of each of them. And the concept was that we would use this um, shared decision-making tool in the clinic for care teams to work with patients and families to decide what to do about uh, FIES. This is a statistical process control chart showing the percentage of eligible patients assessed for FIS during our ILAB. So even though we kind of launched and then had to relaunch, during that time, centers had been working um, on processes. So I think by the time we relaunched, as shown here on the left, we had already reached a very high percentage of, of uh, patients being assessed and documented for, for FIS with a center line of 89% that remained uh, constant for the rest of the island. After we established reliability in documenting FIES, we then tracked whether or not patients were seen for earlier follow-up. And that's shown in this SPC chart here. So once again, we were already at a high level of, with a center line of 72%, and that remained stable for the rest of the island. Again, because um, the incidence of FIS events has declined markedly due to a combination of Trikafta and COVID-19, sometimes the number of events was quite small, which resulted in these very large control limits. Finally, as I mentioned, some of the teams were able to pilot and use the shared decision-making tool. And this chart shows the use of the shared decision-making tool in those teams that incorporated it. So again, we had a fairly high uptake with 73% as our center line that remained sustained for the period of the um, project. Once again, the small ends sometimes re resulted in very large control limits. One other thing we did was we compared some of our performance to that of the care center network, and that's shown in this slide here. So first of all, if we start over here on the left-hand side, there were actually slightly more FIES events in the iLab teams, shown here in the dark blue column, compared to the CFLN overall, shown in lighter blue, and the care center network overall, shown in gray. However, also when we looked at treatment, a significantly higher percentage of FIS events were treated in iLab team uh, centers versus the learning network and the care center network with 75% of events in the iLab versus 63 and 58% for the learning network and care center network respectively. Similarly, there was a significantly higher rate of earlier follow-up scheduled. 66% versus 48 and 46%. 
So in summary, an iLab approach to improvement is feasible and can be highly successful. Some of our key accomplishments include an increase in real-time FIES recognition and assessment, improved early follow-up of FIES events, and progress in utilizing a shared decision-making tool. We also demonstrated higher rates of FIES treatment and early follow-up in FIES iLab teams compared to the entire care center network. So what were some of the keys to success and challenges we faced? Well, I think there were a couple of keys to our success. First was flexibility in designing interventions and processes. We didn't have a strict protocol for how to document real-time FIS, for example. We allowed teams to develop their best processes based upon their PFT software, their EMR, and their clinic flow. And we shared ideas within the teams so that people could apply ideas that would also work for their own clinic. Another key to success was very strong patient and family partnerships, so that our patient and family partners provided very important input throughout the design of the KDD, the aims, and the design of things like our shared decision-making tool, as well as interpreting our results. We definitely faced a lot of challenges. Obviously, I've already mentioned the challenge of COVID-19. The other thing is that because of COVID-19 and the rise of home spirometry and telehealth, we had to develop new processes and workflows for how to deal with these sorts of encounters. For sure, all our teams struggled with having the bandwidth to do um, this on top of all the care they had to do in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. And there was some degree of burnout. I think that was reflected in the fact that not all the teams had enough time to move on to the shared decision-making tool. So in closing, I just want to acknowledge the many people that contributed to the, this work and our success. In particular, Marty Solomon, my co-leader, our other advisors on the leadership team, Stacy Bickle and Raul Famin, our outstanding CFLN team that helped organize things, provide uh, logistics, as well as statistical support, the network leadership team of Mike Powers and Brett Gemmel. Also want to mention one of our patient and family partners, Bean Corcoran, who's been instrumental in helping us analyze and report these data. Of course, we would not be able to compare ourselves to this uh, other care center networks without registry data, which Chris Petrin kindly uh, provided. And then all the FIS iLab teams, and I can't name all the names um, from all the teams, but they were obviously all very instrumental. Finally, I'd like to thank uh, the CF Foundation for funding this uh, effort. For those of you who want to see more about our project, um, there is poster 111, that, um, and Marty's the first author on that poster, that uh, shows a lot of these data in greater detail. So thank you again for um, attending this talk and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference. Good afternoon, I'm Jordan Dunnett and I'll be providing a health-related quality of life iLab update. I have no relevant relationships regarding this presentation. So, why are we focusing on health-related quality of life? Well, first, patients and families indicated it was a priority on a questionnaire regarding our iLabs, but people with CF can and should have full productive lives. Clinicians have come to recognize health beyond clinical measures. But rather than trying to explain it, I'll uh, provide the viewpoint of a CF parent, my um, co-leader, Breck, um, and Breck says, patients want clinicians to have a greater perspective of their lives. Patients want doctors to have greater empathy for the challenges they face. They want clinicians to be more flexible. They want to not have to hide from their doctors. They want to be more honest about what's really going on for them and what they are and aren't doing in the way of adherence. Um, and here's Mackenzie, a person with CF and her perspective. How is health related quality of life different from physical health for CF patients? I believe that health-related quality of life takes into account all aspects of health, not just your physical health. It accounts for mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical health. Each one is just as important, and if any one aspect is suffering, it can weigh down other areas, decreasing our overall quality of life. 
As a patient, if we focus all our attention solely on our physical health, we jeopardize living a fulfilled and happy life. Each patient's picture of what that looks like will certainly be different, but getting there relies on the same well-rounded focus. When all aspects of health are managed and improving, that is when our quality of life can truly take off. So Breck and I met at the beginning of this to try to develop a vision for the project. And we thought that discussing health-related quality of life will improve co-production. It will help patients balance what's best and what can be accomplished and convey their priorities. Addressing health-related quality of life reduces the burden of care, helps patients and clinicians in discussing trade-offs, discussing burden of care and level of risk. As we approached this project, we thought there were some key questions. First, what is health-related quality of life? And in fact, health-related quality of life is really different for each individual. How do you measure it? How do you improve it? How do you measure the improvement? How do you use health-related quality of life data to improve clinical care? So we thought there were a couple of priorities and a couple of concerns. Our main goal was inclusivity. We wanted to develop a, a, an approach, a model that any center could use. Um, we wanted to make sure it was, it was valuable. We wanted to make sure there was utility to the centers, utility to the providers, the teams, and the patients. And we wanted to synergize without replicating existing initiatives. Quality of life certainly overlaps with other concerns such as um, um, mental health. And we wanted to, to work with the, the mental health questions Without, without overlapping. There were some barriers, some concerns, uh, the magnitude, health-related quality of life is huge um, and, and each person defines it differently. It can be very difficult to measure. There are a lot of different approaches um, and it can be quite difficult to intervene and the intervention may vary greatly patient to patient. In addition, uh, we're concerned about time, time for the, the teams to participate in the projects but also we wanted to make sure that, that it didn't um, encroach too much on, on clinic time. Um, the, the time with the patient is already quite full and we wanted to make sure this would fit in the workflow. And we wanted to be sure it was scalable. Um, we wanted to make sure that it was compatible with clinic workflows and electronic medical records. We wanted to be sure that the, that the case was compelling enough that patients, um, providers, care teams, um, would, be, would be motivated to, to um, incorporate this into their activities. So our timeline uh, noted here, uh, our first planning call was in July of 2019, um, and the design day was in 2009, uh, December of 2019. Now, interestingly, uh, uh, triple therapy or Trikafta was started shortly before our design day. And while uh, many people had started on Trikafta, many people with CF, um, we probably only had a handful of return visits, so we didn't really have a, a, a real idea of the impact um, on, uh, on quality of life. And, and really, this was purely a coincidence, the, the timing around um, the initial, initiation of tri triple therapy. Uh, and then there was COVID. And COVID, uh, you know, we, we were uh, overwhelmed with uh, initiating virtual visits. Uh, figuring out how the team functions in, in a virtual environment. And so there's actually quite a delay between the initial design day and, um, and when we began team recruitment. Uh, but uh, we did uh, recruit teams in November and December and finally kicked off in January of this year with the first data submission in February. We um, developed a key driver diagram. Our overall global aim on the left is to improve health-related quality of life for all people with CF, but our first smart aim which is to establish a baseline for health-related quality of life collection and review by March. We wanted to see, could we, could we um, measure it and, and identify a baseline? So some of our key drivers, uh, reliable process to collect surveys, um, clinic review with the patients, understanding the value. So we needed the patients and the providers to understand the value. Um, uh, to do this, we, were gonna, we wanted to combine with existing processes to not increase the workload, we wanted to develop a process for reviewing the results. If we didn't review the results of the survey with the patients, they were not going to be interested in filling it out. Um, and we wanted to have multiple options for collections, things like the EMR, um, in-person, paper, tablet, so that there was some option for, for, for every center. Next, we needed to choose an instrument, um, an instrument for quality of life. 
And we wanted a validated instrument, one that was easy to complete. The patients are already overwhelmed with questionnaires or busy, and we wanted it to be easy for the patient to complete. Easy for the care team to review. Uh, clinic days are already very busy, and uh, we, we didn't want to impose excessively. We wanted to span both pediatric and adult care. Uh, we wanted it to be amenable to the EMR. Uh, in the long run, we wanted it to, to be a systems change. And last, we wanted to be sure that it was informative. We wanted to make sure that it um, provided a useful information regarding quality of life. There are a number of um, instruments we looked at, SF36, CFQR, uh, Flanagan Quality of Life Survey, and then the PROMISE 10. We landed on the PROMISE 10 um, largely um, because it was quick to, to complete. The other instruments were anywhere from five to 15 minutes to complete. While, while the uh, PROMISE 10 could be completed in, other two minute, in under two minutes. We wanted this to be used in every clinic visit. Uh, quality of life is not a once a year thing. Quality of life goes on continuously. We wanted to be able to discuss it and address it with every clinic visit. This is the PROMISE 10. And the other side of this is that it's um, easy to review. So the 10 questions uh, are, um, are basically about um, uh, general health, um, quality of life, physical health, mental health, um, relationships, ability to care, uh, um, I'm sorry, to participate in social activities, ability to participate in physical activities, um, uh, um, the extent that you're bothered by emotional problems, fatigue and pain. And uh, what I really wanted to show is that you could take a very quick look at this um, to review it. So as a provider, as a care team, Basically, you can just look at these answers and say, good, very good, things are okay, fair, these are areas that we need to address. So not only could it be completed quickly, but it could be reviewed quickly. And um, here again is Mackenzie uh, discussing uh, completing what it. What like to answer health-related quality of life questions at your center? Answering the health-related quality of life questionnaire when coming into clinic doesn't take very long. I feel that filling out the questionnaire not only benefits the doctor coming in coming up with a care plan, but it also forces me, the patient, to analyze my quality of life. It allows me time to kind of reflect on the last past three months and how everything has been going in my life. So um, we gathered our uh, health-related quality of life iLab teams that you can see here, and, and we really appreciate all the effort and, and work they've put into their into participation. Um, our workflow, um, there uh, is weekly data entry. So each week we ask them to enter the data from the week before. And the two main data points are what portion of their patients that were eligible filled out the health related quality of life form and what portion of those forms were, were reviewed with the patient by some member of the care team. Um, we meet semi-monthly. So every other week we have a huddle where all of the, all of the teams involved in the project um, uh, meet by Zoom. Uh, in between those uh, uh, meetings, uh, the, uh, the planning team meets to, uh, to uh, plan uh, next steps. Um, so here is our data uh, starting back in February. This was the um, so uh, time along the uh, um, bottom and then percent of patients filling out the survey um, along the y-axis. So we started out uh, in the mid 50s, uh, we're up to the, the uh, mid 60s. So about 66% of patients fill out the form. Uh, we did have a period uh, over the summer where we were really approaching um, level one reliability. Uh, but then uh, for many reasons, uh, some of which we're not sure, but possibly uh, the latest wave of COVID we did, we did fall, although uh, hopefully we're beginning to uh, move up again. Um, and then this is uh, what portion of, of the completed surveys are reviewed. So it's key that we review the survey with the patient. If we don't review it, we don't get the uh, information that we need and, 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 and the patients will feel that's not valued. And, and we are uh, approaching level one reliability um, for review. So um, kind of in summary on the data, we're about 66% as of September 16th for collection, um, but we're up to 89% for review. Um, our aim by the end of the year is to have 80%, at least 80% for both. Um, there are a few teams that have reached uh, level one reliability for 12 teams have reached 
excuse me, reliability for um, collection and seven of 12 have really, uh, reached at least level one reliability for review. Uh, we're now starting to look at what are the responses? What are, what are the areas that, that patients most often voice concern among the children and things like, how often do you really feel sad? You get tired easy. Um, and then among the adults, again, um, it's the, uh, how often you've been bothered by emotional problems in general, what would you rate your mental health, uh, fatigue, uh, social activities? Um, and so again, it is kind of the mental health uh, end of the spectrum that, that um, we, we find the most concern among patients. Um, so in summary, the iLab, uh, an iLab approach to improvement is feasible. Uh, we, we, we've moved forward, we we're collecting data. Um, and it can accelerate progress. We think we're moving quickly more uh, forward more quickly than we might if we were, were, were working alone. Some of our key accomplishments, um, we were able to uh, rapidly implement our Promise 10 at all sites. Uh, we are making uh, gradual progress in the portion of surveys completed, and we've nearly reached level one reliability um, in uh, review of the completed surveys. Uh, some of our keys to success, um, first is the dedication of the uh, quality improvement leader and their teams. Um, we really appreciate all the effort the teams have put in and the quality improvement leaders collecting and submitting data. And the iLab model of shared learning. So our, our, our weekly huddles have been really um, helpful in, in sharing our successes and, and uh, uh, um, you know, sort of stealing shamelessly among, among uh, the, the teams. Some of our challenges, COVID-19, and COVID-19 number one has all of the, you know, challenges that we're all familiar with. But in fact, as we review the, um, the, the Promise 10, a lot of the concerns are actually more related to uh, the COVID-19 uh, than their CF, the, the sort of loneliness, the being stuck, the fear, the, the anxiety. Um, uh, highly effective modulators, um, another challenge. And while they have provided a, a marked improvement in, in quality of life, when we designed this, we didn't have the highly effective modulators. We didn't know what impact they were going to have. Um, and now we maybe need to change what, what our goal is. I mean, um, previously, um, our goal in health-related quality of life and CF patients is to reduce their treatment burden, make their, their quality of life better with respect to CF, but maybe the bar has changed with the highly effective modulators. Folks are feeling so much better that maybe the bar needs to be, you know, how does your life compare to if you didn't have disease at all? Lastly is our measurement tool. There is some concern that uh, maybe it is, is too blunt an instrument. Maybe we're not quite getting at the, the real concerns in quality of life and that many of the patients most of the time are indicating things are good or very good and so maybe we're, we're missing um, so, some of the challenges that they're facing. I'd like to acknowledge and thank uh, all of my colleagues, the folks in the Health Related Quality of Life leadership team, uh, uh, the uh, CFLN team, and everyone involved in design, as well as all of the centers that are uh, participating in our iLab. So I'm gonna offer the wrap up of learning from Innovation Labs. And I'm also gonna speak about the future directions of the Cystic Fibrosis Learning Network. My name is Breck Gamel, and I'm a caregiver of a child with cystic fibrosis. And I'm also the co-chair of the Cystic Fibrosis Learning Network's network leadership team alongside Dr. Mike Powers. I have no disclosures to share. So as we spoke about earlier, the Cystic Fibrosis Learning Network, or CFLN, is a community of care teams and people with CF improving care together. We're building a connected system for rapid learning and sharing among care teams, researchers, caregivers, and people with CF. And the purpose of the Learning Network is to use these partnerships to innovate and achieve outcomes that push us beyond the current system. One of the things I wanted to do today is to really share about our big takeaways from all the iLabs so far. We know that iLabs, in fact, offer a great place for multi-cystic fibrosis center, peer-to-peer, -peer, rapid learning and sharing. We also know that all stakeholders, including patients and family members, need to be a part of the learning process from the very beginning. 
We know that we must have the right data to learn and to adapt. And we've also learned that the answers to our questions are going to be found locally within the local CF center. We've learned that all contexts are different. What works at one cystic fibrosis center doesn't necessarily work at another CF center, either due to the CF center's unique structure, needs, barriers, or population. And along those same lines, we've learned that one, si one size does not fit all for all tools. A tool might work in one context and might not work in the other. And so this need to personalize, depending on the CF center's needs, is critical for improving care. Here are some celebrations and barriers. We can celebrate the innovation is happening within the iLab. We know that our CF Center's QI teams are innovating and learning very quickly how to use a tool or a method for change and discovering how that might work in their unique CF Center. We can also celebrate that our iLabs are guiding us where we need to go next. It is through the data that we gain in the iLabs that help us know where to put our energies next. Data is critical for improving a system. And one barrier that we've run into with our iLabs is the need for health outcome data rather than just process data. So what do we wanna do with all these new learnings from these iLabs? We wanna spread them. Our goal through these iLabs is that we can spread what we've learned from the Cystic Fibrosis Learning Network within the network eventually to the entire CF care network. We know that our CF care centers are busy and overwhelmed, particularly right now. So we want data-driven ideas that have been tested to be shared with all those who can benefit. Ultimately, the goal is to improve the lives of all people with CF and to do so as quickly, efficiently, and effectively as possible. So in addition to learning how to innovate rapidly, we also are using the iLabs to help us learn in the Cystic Fibrosis Learning Network what successful spread looks like. To have successful spread, we know that you must share technical interventions. We must socialize improvement ideas with others. Today's symposium is just one avenue of this sharing. And we also must make sure that communication and collaboration is intertwined. Questions that we're asking ourselves are, what are the value of the changes that have been tested? And what are the team's behaviors for adoption? Relationships and storytelling solidifies intrinsic motivation. So we're learning how to make sure that we have all the pieces lined up before we spread what we've learned. But doing so is of the most importance. So I'd like to share a little bit about the communication strategies in the Cystic Fibrosis Learning Network. We're very much learning how to share good ideas and how to make that, that sharing and learning rapid. Here are a couple of different ways that we've done that. One is through a commons, which is an asynchronous way to share good ideas in real time with among team members and across CF centers. Another way is through a toolkit, and it's a less formal written document to share tools and good ideas from the community. A change package, which we've spoken about today, is a more formal written way to share change ideas and to use data to be able to demonstrate effectiveness so that others can use it. And a community of practice is a small community wanting to learn together in a short-term ongoing virtual connection which typically uses a tool and a tool to test and uh, content experts to help along the way. And of course, we all know that publications, the most formal of these is very important for sharing good ideas to the entire healthcare community. So we've spoken about change packages, but I'll just kind of give you an overview one more time. The purpose of a change package is to capture well-tested change concepts rooted in process reliability and outcome-based improvement in a written form for others to use and to implement. It's a bit of a starting point or like a how-to manual. And these ideas within a change package continue to develop over time as change packages, uh, change packages are used within the local context and then improved. So we consider it a living document. And examples of change packages within the CFLN that are currently in development or have been completed include the telehealth change package, co-production change package, timely data change package, and the FIES change package. And I'll speak just a moment about the center level co-production change package. So co-production is partnering with patients and family members. And co-production and quality improvement efforts are foundational in the Cystic Fibrosis Learning Network as it should be in all, C in all CF quality improvement. 
In fact, we developed a change package to be shared with all of our Cystic Fibrosis Learning Network centers about how to do co-production at the center level. In the Cystic Fibrosis Learning Network, our patients and family members are brought in as a part of the QIT. They're trained in quality improvement, just like the rest of the team. And they are foundationally and critically important for the improvement work of our CF centers. So we gathered data um, about this, change ideas, how it's been successful, how to keep sustainability, how to recruit, onboard, how to develop partnership, and how to op operate with uh, patient and family leadership. And we put this together in a document. And that document has actually been uh, utilized in a community of practice where we've taken a part portion of it and tested it. And then we took those good ideas and fed it back into the document. So it will continue to develop over time. So let's look forward in the future of the Cystic Fibrosis Learning Network. The global aim for people, the global aim for the Cystic Fibrosis Learning Network is that all people with cystic fibrosis would live fulfilling lives. And we have a couple of areas of focus that we're particularly focusing on. And one is patient reported outcomes. Another is traditional clinical outcomes. And then the third is equity. So our goals for 2020, in the context of highly effective modulator treatment or therapy, we hope to pursue improvement processes to impact key clinical and health-related quality improvement outcomes. We plan to do this with a uh, lens of equity, and we also hope to advance uh, the Cystic Fibrosis Learning Health System, spreading the culture and practices of the CFLN to more programs within the CF Care Center Network. We also wanna learn from and interact with other components of the Cystic Fibrosis Care Center Network. We're really looking to go beyond the traditional measures of FEV1 and BMI, although we'll continue with that, but we also are really looking forward to um, looking at health-related quality of life or some other patient-reported outcome, um, and again, do that with the lens of equity. So let's talk about health equity for a moment. Um, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention define health equity as this. When everyone has the opportunity to be as healthy as possible, as such, equity is a process and equality is an outcome of that process. So this is actually from the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, a white paper on equity. And these are three specific ways um, that they recommend building QI equity. And so we're using lots of resources from outside our community to be able to know where to kind of go in this direction. And so here are three ideas that we wanted to share and encourage you to also uh, pick up this paper from the uh, IHI. So the first is to build will to address health equity. And we're doing that by listening and learning from our community. We know that this is important to our community. We know that there are lots of different initiatives happening among the cystic fibrosis uh, healthcare community and, and uh, patients and family members. And so we are listening and learning. The next strategy that they suggest is to build equity as a priority in the organization's strategic plan. And we've already begun that work. And last, they recommend demonstrate senior leader ownership for and commitment to improving health equity. And again, we're working to co-develop a shared vision for equity with the community. So more specifically, we're hoping to build an infrastructure to support health equity. We wanna create the data infrastructure to improve, uh, excuse me, I can't move health equity. I gotta move my own little screen here. Um, we wanna obtain stratified data based on the attributes of race, ethnicity, and language. Um, current goals for the CFLN are to develop a process to obtain the stratified data at both the local and the network level. And we're working with the Cystic Fibrosis Registry team to get that equity data to make improvements. So curb cuts for the disadvantaged, disadvantaged help us all. This is a really neat um, story from that actually Cater Mate um, from the IHI 2020 forum keynote address actually shared it's on YouTube and would highly recommend um, that you uh, view it. But Cater actually talks about the story of where cu curb cuts began and curb cuts are the little cuts within a sidewalk that all of us are familiar with. Um, certainly if you have a wheelchair, you are very appreciative of the fact that you can um, you know, slowly roll off the curb instead of having to just jump off. But at one point they did not exist. And so there was a big push to uh, have them placed in the sidewalk so that um, the disadvantaged could then be able to more smoothly use the sidewalk. And what they found was that 
it, uh, the curb cuts did not just help the disadvantaged, but it also helped people with strollers. It helped uh, delivery men who were delivering food to a grocery store. It helped um, all of us with carts and being able to bring our foods um, to our cars. Like there were a lot of advantages that came for those from those that weren't necessarily disadvantaged because curb cuts were placed in. And so um, that's really a picture of what we want to take forward when we're looking at this data with a lens of equity. Uh, quality improvement helps us to identify our gaps. We're able to look at our data and find out where the gaps are. And we know that improving the system for the disadvantaged is going to improve the system for all. So we do know that QI cannot be done without a lens of equity. But we also are very aware that we are still very much listening and learning from our community to know exactly where those curb cuts should come in and how they should be placed. So we're very mindful that we're in a listening and learning stage, but we do know that we are looking at how our data can inform uh, where to improve the system for all people. So this uh, concludes the end of my presentation. I just wanted to thank all of our cystic fibrosis teams um, and all of our speakers in our presentation. Um, this work is the work of many people who are very passionate about improving the lives of people with CF, both clinicians and patients and family members. And I just want to thank everybody uh, who has participated in the work of the CFLN and contributed to today's presentation. Um, so thank you to our CF teams. And I also will mention that um, we are supported in part by an award uh, from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. This concludes the end of the recorded part of the presentation, and we will move to the um, live portion. <clears throat> Hello, this is Mike Powers. Um, looks like we're having some technical difficulties here. Welcome uh, to the uh, question and answer session of the CF Learning Network. Um, I want to thank Dana, Clement, Jordan, and Breck. Like uh, for all uh, participating and presenting on the symposium today. Um, it was truly a team effort as we uh, discussed in our presentations. Um, I just wanted to briefly review, we wanted to share the concepts of a learning health system, uh, learning some QI tools and techniques and approaches. Um, and you heard, you know, we learn from each other. Uh, we learn from data. Uh, we had peer-to-peer -peer learning. And a concept from the iLabs, it was the rhythm of the work, uh, the, the, the huddles by the leaders, the huddles by the teams uh, gave us a rhythm and allowed us to be successful during the pandemic. It was amazing all this work continued to be done. And as we've learned over the last six months and continue to learn, um, we're, do, we're, we're pivoting our goals for 2022 and using the lens of equity. So um, we did get a few questions into the Q&A. Um, but I also wanted to um, start off with um, uh, what a question for Breck uh, around the equity concept. Uh, you talked about um, you know learning about equity and sharing learning learning about equity, Breck. Uh, how has uh, CF Learning Network done that at this point? 
That's a great question, Mike. Uh, the CF Learning Network has done it in a variety of ways. Um, there's a lot of learning going on, a lot of listening. Um, we have uh, been very uh, closely um, learning from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation's Racial Justice uh, Group, uh, who's been listening to the community. Um, we've also been learning from other networks. Uh, the Anderson Center uh, houses a lot of different networks, um, the IBD network, and um, I won't even give them all because I'll forget them uh, being live here. But there are a lot of other networks that are uh, addressing this topic as well. So there's a lot of learning across networks. There's a lot of learning within the CF Foundation uh, and, and other networks, even within the CF Foundation, um, are, other groups are, are working on this. So there's a lot of learning from there. Um, we're also kind of evaluating how we can improve patient and family partner recruitment recruitment so that we have a more diverse patient and family partner voice within the CFLN and uh, even looking at uh, developing um, some type of uh, advisory committee, uh, again, with, with voices um, that are often those that you don't hear. So there's a lot of listening, a lot of learning, reading, um, and a lot of reaching out, making connections uh, to who is on this topic and knows about it and can help us um, be able to do this well, do it right. Thanks so much. Um, and uh, Kathy Sabadosa asked a question in the Q&A. Um, I'm going to direct this to Dana. Um, and the concept that you heard about three labs, we had the infrastructure to support labs, um, and they're highly organized. Well, how would a, a local center that's, that's not part of the learning network, how would they incorporate some of our teachings today, and how would they jumpstart their quality improvement efforts? So that's a great question. Um, and my team has participated in all these three labs, which is amazing. I was actually opposed to it. Uh, when they wanted to do the uh, health-related quality of life, I was like, maybe we should hold off, but they felt very strongly about it. So I'm really, really grateful to my team for all the effort they put in. I have to tell you that we are super QI-oriented, so we do everything exactly as Mike described. So we look at model for improvement, what do we want to study? How are we going to do it? And what do we want to achieve? And how are we going to measure our data? So um, we, we start with uh, goals, specific aims, um, and we build our KDDs uh, for very complex processes. We do SFMEAs, and then we jump into, and jump into PDSAs. And I think the goal to success is have the entire team, like, like you saw in plenary, the entire team contribute. Um, it's a collaborative leadership. It's not a pyramidal leadership with our team. Uh, and our patient family partners are part of the process too. They participate to our team meetings. And with every team meeting, we discuss our KDDs and what's our PDSA. Why are we going to test this this week? So that's our, our success story. Thanks, Dana. Uh, maybe I'll throw it out to the whole panel. How, how you uh, learn these QI techniques and tools and how can we help teams get beyond some of the, you know, these, these kind of things that we've learned second nature, what, what resources have you used, um, you know, uh, to, to help with this process? I've shared that we've used the Institute of Healthcare Improvements website to learn about these tools and, and um, you can take courses at the IHI, you can get 20 MOC points for physicians um, to take six modules that takes about three or four hours and teaches you all about QI. But what about the rest of the panel? Where have you learned these tools and, and how has your team learned these techniques? You know, Mike, I was gonna say that we also use the IHI resources a lot. Also our hospital has uh, QI um, training available. I think a lot of hospitals do. So, so um, that's that's what we do. Um, but I think um, so. I'll put the CFF on the spot, even though I don't think they're officially here. You know, a lot of it really started because the foundation did things like the learning and leadership collaborative and all these sorts of things to, that that I think really jump started QI for a lot of centers and be great if we can continue those sorts of programs. I want to uh, second uh, Clement's comment. Uh, the LLC is where, where we started. Um, uh, uh, I think the LLC two or something like that. So uh, really the CF Foundation is where we got our start. Um, our hospital 
Um, or actually it's our practice group uh, does QI training and I've gone through the, our practices QI course twice. One with the, once with the pediatric social worker and once with the adult dietitian, uh, CF Learning Network. And then IHI videos are great. I mean, you can, you know, you can just uh, six, eight minutes and you can, uh, you can learn a topic uh, or at least, you know, get exposure to a topic. So those IHI videos have been really helpful as well. And then also actually the, uh, the textbook from Dartmouth, the name of which microsystems or something. I don't remember exactly, but uh, um, we've used that as well. And Brad, right. comment about a patient and family partner learning QI. Sure. Yeah, so um, I've had the privilege of actually uh, having some QI training um, as a part of my work in the CFLN, but we've taken that to the patient and family partners um, and, and taught them alongside the clinicians. And what we found is that, you know, we have patient and family partners who um, uh, honestly do this work even in their own day-to-day -day lives. And so they come in and teach us things that we didn't know. So that's been very cool. But there, there does need to be, if this is going to be a common language and we're going to be using it in our centers and we want to partner fully with a patient and family member, we've got to be able to give them the skills to be able to speak this language. So it's really a continued ongoing training for our patient and family partners, as well, as well as, again, recognizing that they come in with their own skills and we want to um, learn from them. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to throw this question to Dana. Um, and it was alluded to in the plenary by Michelle and um, Rhonda, but what's the future of telehealth and CF care and how can we make sure it delivers excellent care? Yeah, so there is definitely a future for telehealth. Um, we know this uh, from the surveys done uh, previously, state of care survey, and from the patient perception with telehealth survey uh, uh, done by several CFLN teams that has been published. So patients with CF will, will, would like to have telehealth in their future, and it's definitely um, having a role in the future uh, care model. However, exactly how and uh, what type of telehealth is, it, it, what, what will be the ideal formula of telehealth with in-person visits remains to be researched. And there are several uh, research initiatives and workshops and uh, things that CFF uh, is looking into to uh, maybe research that or, or um, establish some guidelines for the future. Thanks, Dana. Uh, my bias has been um, that survey revealed patients want some of their visits to be telehealth, and the institutions are putting a lot of pressure on the care teams to do all their visits face-to-face, -face. so we really have to find that balance for our patients and what works for them and what works for their health, obviously. Um, so, yeah, we'll be learning over the next one or two years, and that's the other point I want to make about the learning network health system, we are continuously learning. You have to have that attitude. We're gonna collect data and we're gonna adapt. Our telehealth um, iLab team did 22 PDSAs to adapt, 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 adapt. So we continuously learn through the pandemic to improve telehealth. And now we're having to adapt again because the institution has changed our platform this month, <laughs> 18 months into it. All right. Uh, Clement, there was some questions about um, in the you know correlating with uh, telehealth is the future about home spirometry and the challenges of it. Uh, the UVA adult team is published on it, done a great job with it. But what are the challenges for pediatric patients and their families? Yeah, so we talked a lot about this. You know, there were a lot of chats about this during, you know, we had during our regular meetings and. Um, you know, definitely training um, and teaching. Um, also, patients just feeling comfortable with it. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think a lot of a lot of telehealth visits in children were not they were not able to obtain reliable spirometry um, for various reasons. And so that's definitely in an area that yeah, I see. I, there, I can see there's a lot of posters about that. Um, it's, I think it's going to be an intersection of there's going to be some research that needs to be done, but I think there's also an opportunity for QI and um, maybe um, another innovation lab topic. Do you think the SIS signal, the, the symptom indicated symptom, did that, was that helpful? Did teams find that useful? 
Yeah, I didn't talk about that. We, you know, in my presentation, but right, we we did try to also develop like a symptom based indication signal, um, and we piloted that. Um, and um, I, I don't. I my sense was it didn't really take off as much. Uh, um, and again, I think that gets back to one of what I said was one of the challenges is, and is that. Um, trying to adapt all this stuff while also trying to do telehealth and just everything else related to COVID-19. I think there people really didn't, you know, it was hard to, for, for people to have the bandwidth to, to do all that. Thank you, Clement. Um, Jordan, you elaborated on, um, you know, how quality of life has changed after highly effective modulators and the challenges of what, maybe what tool to use or how to measure that. Can you elaborate on that, but also comment on um, kind of survey burden? Um, you know, people are filling out promise him, but they're also filling out mental health surveys. And we do day of visit form, and we're trying to figure that out at our local level. Yeah, it, it, um, certainly the uh, um, survey burden is a problem. Um, people get, get tired of them. So we, we need to make sure whatever surveys we do are useful. Um, certainly there's overlap between the promise 10 and the uh, PHQ-9, the GAD-7, and, and there's, you know, certainly overlap between mental health and, and, and quality of life. I mean, um, yeah, I think that uh, you can't have one without the other, um, uh, but but there there are aspects that the, that the PROMISE-10 get at that the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7 don't. Um, so it, it, it is a work in progress. We have to figure out how to not overburden um, our, our patients, but still Get the get the important information. Make sure that we're we're seeing the patient as a whole, um, their physical health, their mental health, their their quality of life. Um, you know, looking at the whole picture, addressing the whole picture, and and, and promise ten may or may not be the way to do that. And we're that that's actually is part of the iLab and part of our current discussion is is this the proper tool? Um, and then you know, as I mentioned, the recording session and 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 it's an ongoing discussion of. Um, what, what should our, our bar be for quality of life? Um, you know, I mean, it's so different than two or three years ago. And if you, um, I think Dave Nichols in his session was talking about how the, um, the uh, CFQR, they've almost topped it out. So they, they've almost kind of hit a ceiling using the CFQR and that people's at least respiratory um, health or their respiratory symptom, symptomology it, 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 they're, they're saying they're not having symptoms anymore. So um, we, we have to rethink this. What is, you know, what, what are the important questions to ask? Um, we also have to keep in mind that, you know, 10% of our patients aren't eligible for modulators and some haven't responded and some still have severe disease. So um, while there's a huge portion of patients that are at the, you know, really good quality of life, we, we you know, definitely, you know, can't leave. And maybe it's the most important portion of our patients are the ones that either haven't responded to the modulators or aren't, aren't eligible. Um, I do think we're going to need the patient's um, uh, input on this. Um, I think we're going to have to ask the patients again, sort of, wh where are the, the deficits of quality of life? Uh, I don't know if deficits is the right word, but where are the um, gaps? Um, e even though we have highly effective modulators, what are the things that, that still separate you from 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 your your you know friends, colleagues, um, family members that don't have CF? So um, you know I, I think there's still a lot of work to be done. I think we certainly need to you know the, the most important thing is the, the patient input of of you know wh wh where wh where should we be heading? So uh, Breck, why don't you uh, from the parents' perspective, uh, comment on that as well. And then I'm going to ask any patients or parents in the audience, please chat in. What, what's important to you in terms of your health and the concept around well-being? Yeah, I was just going to add to what Jordan said. I think um, that we're learning in that health-related quality of life iLab that um, you know patients and family members are happy to fill out surveys if they find it valuable and it improves their care. And so I think that's really important when we are giving more and more surveys, which are ways that we have to gain, you know, get data in order to change the system. Um, in QI, we need data. It's just that's how you do QI. So if patient and family members are going to be inundated with surveys, we found that they are uh, very um, 
open to it if they find it valuable. And one of the important things we've also learned in the Health Related Quality of Life iLab is that uh, there is a high level of um, reviewing it back with the patients. And so again, if, if the uh, clinicians are looking at it and using that to improve care, then um, there is a, a, a quicker adoption and more interest from the patients and family members. And the opposite is true. If you're just getting it for data and then not really giving it back to the patients and family members, it's going to go really low on their priority list that day during their clinic visit. So. Um. At my local team, uh, we even measured, did the, did the provider seeing the patient review the Promise 10 with the patient? So we, we tracked that, we documented it because it was so important. And that was voiced by our, our patient and family partners to really, really just exactly what Breck <coughs> elaborated on um, to really use it. And you heard Michelle in the plenary talk about the PEP program. So you're partnering, you're starting that conversation, you're partnering with a patient. We use, I, I use the Promise 10 sometimes to start that, what matters to you. I see that you filled this out. I see that this is going on. It, it, it all works together of, of building that trust and, and listening. That, that was another thing that came up in Michelle's talk about listening with empathy. I'm going to throw a question now towards Clement. Uh, a question came in about the, your data in terms of follow-up data, Clement, as well as um, how did you work with the registry and, and how is that information extracted from the registry about your follow-up data? Yeah, that's good. That's a really good question. I, I think it get, again it gets back to why you know doing this was still pretty labor-intensive. Um, you know, people were supposed to we did PBSAs every two weeks. We had monthly surveys, so because some of the data that's like like documenting FIS in real time, that's not something you can capture in the registry. So we had to basically uh, enter that. Each team had to enter that their monthly numbers um, uh, into the uh, into a red cap, and and I think that just got to be really hard after a while. The but but certain things like follow up, and I realized also I wasn't clear I, I, in that. The, it was actually um, whether it was scheduled. That's actually a data field in the um, in in the registry. So um, when the, when so 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 we were fortunate. Again, I think that's partly what's great about working in the learning network, being funded by the CF Foundation. In addition to the funding from the CF Foundation, they commit registry resources to be able to make these sorts of custom reports for us. Uh, thanks, Clement. I'm just gonna. <clears throat> Uh, average chat in about using Twitter to learn. Um, I'm at Pete's Palm Mike. I saw that Kathy uh, Sabadosa tweeted last night about um, on demand session five. I believe it's all about how the registry is being rebuilt to be much more user friendly. So I'm going to go learn about that. And again, um, uh, the registry team is and the foundation is supporting efforts that we can use registry more actively for quality improvement in, in improving care in the future um, and actively using that data. It looks like Dana currently, her team actively is using, you know, reviewing those center reports. And, you know, if, you, if and you heard, um, I spoke about timely data entry as well, Breca did as well. Why do we have timely data entry from all of our CF Learning Network teams so we can use the data? So that was one goal is to enter all of our clinical data within 30 days so we could use the, the, the registry to look at outcomes of our network. If you're a team that only enters your data every three months, you cannot use the registry for quality improvement work. And in fact, most of our teams got down to seven days. Um, what we found, though, you have to have a dedicated person or a dedicated team to enter that data, and it has to be a point of emphasis, and it takes funding. So people um, funded it apart from their center, center grants. Uh, we use a team of research coordinators. That turned out a lot of research coordinators were doing data entry, and I think teams were finding funding for that, but that's, that's a real point of emphasis. Um, let's see here. Just looking at any additional questions. Did anyone else have a comment about that uh, in terms of um, uh, their data entry or anything like that, or were, were there, um, 
you know, it takes data and it takes uh, local data as well as uh, network data. So that's a concept to think about your local data um, and learn and learn what's a priority for for your team. Um, I have a question just in general for the group. <clears throat> we all were different leaders for the iLabs. How, how did we learn from each other? How did we teach each other? How, how was that operation? Oh, Mike, you, you went out. You're oh, muted. I'm, go ahead. I said, go ahead. I just want to. Yeah, how did we learn from each other? Well, certainly the periodic group meetings. I mean, there were there were periodic leader meetings that uh, provided us with updates on, on how the labs were doing and an opportunity to kind of talk about where where our challenges were, where the you know, where the concerns were, were um, and, and, you know, learn from the previous iLabs where how they got over hurdles. Um, so that was certainly helpful. And then the, the common team between you and the group at Cincinnati, um, certainly that, that had oversight and, and you know, t took the, the uh, challenges from one iLab and, and, and helped the next. I would just say that it's, I'm really serious. I think it's just um, sort of uh, inspiring and, uh, aspirational to see the leadership and ener energy of um, all the other leaders. So, you know, seriously, you know, um, Dana and Jordan, Mike and, and Breck, and, and just being able to uh, sort of see that sort of uh, uh, energy um, is kind of really helped us, at least me, to, to kind of try to bring the same thing to our to our pipeline. Uh, I agree. Uh, and I think I might be the youngest uh, leader here. So I want to also mention that for me, Mike was a mentor and that was um, very good. I felt like I grew a lot um, in my career and as a person by doing this uh, iLab. So more than just being a leader for the lab. And I used to joke with my team when we would create the process always ask them, so how can this benefit other teams? Because now I have so many other teams <laughs> that I need to help. Uh, so I think it was it was a very, very um, good experience for me. I loved it. Every single, every single meeting I had actually told my team um, and like my leadership team that I miss it because we stopped having the leadership uh, teams for the uh, telehealth ILAM. So it brings up the concept of the relationships, right? Relationships moves QI. Uh, I meet weekly with Breck. We are partners. Um, we, we, we are in sync. Um, and so it's, it's about relationships and leaning on peers. So I'm just thinking about how we can help the rest of the care center network, how, they can, how we can coach them. You were going to say something, Breck? Well, I was just going to say that I think it's the structure that allows us to be working uniquely with um, with a certain focus, whether it be telehealth and uh, FIS, you know, you're working kind of on lung health and then um, and then we're looking at health related quality of life. They're very different. And at times we didn't really know the specifics of what each lab was working on, but it was easy to find out. Um, we had a structure that, uh, that did allow us to be able to kind of know what's going on very quickly. Um, and then there was also like just some things that each lab, iLab has, like the data. And obviously once we, you know, and, and even our teams, um, Dana was talking about, you know, teams are in multiple iLabs. And so they themselves can help uh, bridge these gaps. But then there's also just, you know, expectations were very similar. And so at the end, we, you know, we're asking ourselves, what do we do with it? What we've, what we've learned, um, health related quality of, quality of life is not at the end yet, but as these have wrapped up different sections of the work, uh, then we've asked ourselves the questions about spread. And it feels really good to be asking a big question with a lot of different people that are doing all the same work. So it's a, it's a bigger structure. And I think that's what the Cystic Fibrosis Learning Network really does fantastically well, is it's a bit of a big tent. And so people are at different uh, tables working uh, intimately with different topics, uh, but we're all working um, with the same goal. And I agree, Clement, I think that what's really awesome is to see people equally passionate um, to improve care with people for people and with people uh, with cystic fibrosis. I want to mention one more thing. So for junior faculty who are currently in CFLN, 
there has been a tremendous interest in CFLN to help junior faculty rise in their career. And there are a lot of opportunities that might show up for leadership roles. Don't be afraid to jump in. Uh, like Brack was saying, we have the infrastructure. The infrastructure is there, the, op the operational teams and the QI um, experts that help with the CFLN are amazing. So they are gonna guide you through the process. Don't be afraid, be courageous. You know, it's a lot of work, but it's worth it. Wow, you guys are all inspiring. Um, and the CF Foundation has, provides amazing support and the community provides amazing support. Um, you know, I'm new to QI from since 2013. Um, I had a bench lab for 23 years. Um, so that was kind of a second, this is my second career basically as, as a clinician CF provider and learn through um, just like uh, Jordan and Clement, I, our team participated in a learning uh, leadership collaborative and then we were invited to participate in CF Learning Network and that passion in learning from other people just kind of uh, drove me to to these new opportunities and again it's around relationships um, of, of learning together and having the intrinsic motivation. I would like to share another resource that I, I commonly share with people it's a, another IHI white paper called the psychology of change basically teaches you how to do team quality improvement work and valuing everyone's voice and having teaches about skills. And I'd recommend the course from the Institute of Healthcare Improvement as well. Uh, Mike, can I piggyback on that too? I, I just also want to bring attention to the fact that this work couldn't be done unless it was the, the people on the ground that are doing it, collecting the data. You know, our quality improvement leads are often nurse coordinators or social workers. There's sort of a variety of different roles that have been the quality improvement leads for their individual centers. And they, um, they are, you know, literally tally marking at times uh, to gather this data. And so um, I just want to make sure that, you know, that we give space to, to just really thank those people that do this every day in the midst of COVID and picking up the phone and taking care of patients. And of course, again, patients are the ones also providing their data many times. And so um, just really grateful. I mean, as, as much as it's exciting to be the leader, uh, it couldn't happen if it wasn't for our clinicians and our, our patients and family members uh, doing this um, really daily. So. And um, I wanted to comment, there's a question around uh, getting, um, how do we get patients and family partners involved at local level? So what lessons can we teach other centers, Breck, um, uh, about that and, and and you know you your your group has developed a change package around that and, and how do we share that kind of information with people, with other centers yeah i mean it's a lot of trial and error um but i think the cfln and it's uh, about six years of existence has figured out a pretty good way of doing it um lots of areas to improve but um but we do have uh most of our teams have a patient family member embedded um on the team. And I think, again, I think that comes from um, a real openness and a vulnerability, as Dana was saying about just, you know, be brave is, is really for the teams to open up and invite someone outside of the team onto the team. Uh, that was that was one of our biggest challenges initially. I think as people began to realize what an improvement this was to um, to our work, when a patient family member could be there in the room, when uh, decisions were being made to improve processes, and you know really head off. Um, issues very early on. Hey, that isn't going to work. There's no way. I don't, have you ever brought three kids to the clinic? I'm not going to be able to do that. I mean, those kind of things are super helpful for the team. And, um, and then I think the other thing is that the team really saw our patient family members as humans and our patient family members saw our, their, our clinicians as humans. And we've really created a culture in the CFLN to see that um, shared humanity and shared expertise. Um, and so uh, that has been really helpful, I think, for uh, sustainability. But ultimately, patient uh, ultimately teams have to be willing to um, go out and recruit a patient family member who would be willing to um, give some of their time and their expertise. And then we've also uh, found that uh, financial recognition is really helpful for sustaining that relationship as well. Patients and family members are many times taking time off of work. Um, there may be uh, joining in on meeting. Zoom has been fantastic. COVID has been fantastic for us to be able to do co-production because then people can Zoom, you know, on their lunch break. Um, but they're having to get babysitters. And so we've also found that um, having some institutional support with, um, you know, being able to 
um, financially uh, recognize our patient and family members has also been really helpful. So we have created a change package um, and we're continuing to use it to te and test it. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that it's, um, you know, uh, it's going to work for everybody in every situation. We know QI is local, but it is something that um, teams could certainly begin trying at their own center. Uh, we've got a, um, a pretty uh, clear process for recruiting a patient and family member, um, and we'd love to have more centers test it out and let us know. And then we want to look at it again through the lens of equity and really ask, is are we able to get all the voices that we want at the table um, done well? So um, that's kind of our next step. Will that change package be available to teams outside the learning network? Well, I think that's a challenge because the learning network is unique in its culture. I, we don't know if it's going to be successful. I, it certainly is something that we can absolutely share with any team. I mean, what, this is part of um, our goal today is to share what we're learning outside the CFL in and, and with other CF centers. So, yeah, absolutely. We'd be happy to, to share that with anyone who's interested. Um, but will it work in the same capacity? We don't know. We, we just need to test it. Thanks, Brooke. And I just want to make a comment in terms of what's successful and with your co-production of patient and family partners um, and how this all works, you know, how QI can work. I, I remember a comment from Jordan at one of those 7.30 or 8 o'clock meetings at our community conference, you know, what, what is making this work? And he said the rhythm of the work is making this work. So we recommend your teams have weekly or biweekly meetings the other thing that's been published is a physician champion has to be present. So they, the team understands this work is important. You can't have it and not be present. And then you have to be coached. Successful teams have to be coached. We are very fortunate. We have quality improvement consultant coaches. But find a colleague that, that knows QI. Find your local QI people to help coach you. And then you need that shared purpose, right? And our shared purpose or goals is for all people with CF to have a fulfilling lives. Um, was there any other general comments people wanted to share from the panel uh, to expand on, on their presentations? Um, we're pretty close to hitting all the questions. Um, there is one sort of technical question from Lucretia about explaining the SFMEA. Uh, Dana shared that in her presentation. I'd recommend again, going to the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, but also the, uh, Telehealth 365, uh, NACFC, we did a, a telehealth uh, uh, um, course and I did a presentation on the SFMEA and how you use that, how you develop that is a way to uh, find the barriers to a process. So you develop a process map and develop steps of the process. So we developed steps, steps of our telehealth process and then you below, uh, in the red columns, you, you you delineate for each one of those processes, what's a barrier, what's a challenge, what's going to get in the way at your local team level. And then on the top part of the SFMEA form, you then write in, how can we intervene? How can we overcome those challenges? And <clears throat> that translates directly uh, if, into interventions and change ideas that you can then potentially use for PDSAs. So that's how we use it. The failure modes, the F <coughs> failure modes, what's going to block it, but then the effects analysis are the interventions, what's going to hopefully that you can test. And we did that as an entire um, learning network that Dana presented, but each team was asked to do their own local, what's locally a barrier. I'm hearing currently licensures for many states is a barrier. So how do we overcome that? So that, that might be a, a, a next step or challenge. Um, anyone else have any thoughts they want to share? We have about, I'd say it looks like about eight minutes. Well, I guess what I, I would, uh, just, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I just wanted to add a final thanks to um, the, the, uh, CFLN leadership, the folks at Cincinnati, and all the teams on the uh, on our iLab that have been so flexible and, and enthusiastic, and and you know uh, um, uh, just good, um, so dedicated to the effort. And then my my team at home because I don't get to do any of this stuff unless I got a, a really strong team. I mean, um, when I'm participating in all these activities, I can do this because I know I have a fabulous team at home that is taking care of the patients and taking care of the program. So I want to make sure I thank them out loud. So thank you. I second Jordan. 
thank you uh, for the teams participating in the in the iLab and my team. I love my team. They are great. Uh, I, I, well, Dana asked me a question, so I'll answer that first. What the future of telehealth and pediatric care? And Micah, you can comment too. I mean, I think it's definitely going to always have a role. I think it's just we're going to have to find better ways to, you know, the other issue with home spirometry is 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 making sure you're accounting for in, in children, uh, accounting for, for for height growth and 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 also building that process. In not, I mean, you have to measure the heights, but you also have to get the parents to enter the correct height into update the height into the spirometer. Um, but I'll tell you, actually, another area that we used it a lot and and that we still were using is actually with the infants because again you're supposed to see them monthly right so being able to and, and some of our patients are coming from two or three hours away and doing that every month is really challenging so you know being able to do some of those as telehealth visits helped but um so i think I definitely think there's going to be a role and again i think there's going to be a need for both quality improvement as well as some actual research to be able to to ultimately uh, bring that forward. But I guess what I was going to try to really say to people who are not, I mean, a lot of the stuff we do in the CFLN, um, we do have a lot of support. And so that's, I think that makes us, you know, that gives us certain, makes it easier, but, but there's a lot that, you know, I think people can adapt from the, what the principles of the CFLN, which in particular, I think, uh, as Brett was bringing up, you know, strong patient and uh, uh, family partnerships and really engaging them. I think that's one of the very special things about the, the, the CFLN, but I think it's obviously something that, 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 uh, that any uh, center can do. Um, and uh, I think as we get more, as, as, as the EMR becomes stronger and stronger, I think, again, a lot of this intensive data use could really come out of our EMR. Actually, one of the things that we're starting here at CHOP is we're doing, uh, um, they call it Healthy Planet, but it's essentially uh, an Epic-based um, uh, platform for both uh, to, to actually create registries within Epic to do population health management and generate um, kind of uh, patient care reports and things. Um, and hopefully when we finish this process in sometime in the next six to 12 months, um, we'll share it with everybody. And I know that's just for Epic, but hopefully it will be adaptable to other um, EMRs. Thank, thank you, Clement. I'll just quickly comment telehealth. Uh, we find it advantageous for infants too. We wait to maybe about the fourth or fifth month because we really want to develop that relationship with the family and really want to provide education. Um, and we do, we have a big state in Oregon. And I saw a patient yesterday on Tricapta. He blew 131% for his FE1. His weight went from the 50th to the 75th percentile. They didn't want to drive back in three months and get checked out again. So how, how am I to argue? We did, we're doing a virtual three month follow up. Their quality of life was excellent. Um, I'm looking for, okay, another question came in. Um, for Clement, appreciate the behavior change you captured across the teams and comparing with centers in the iLab, CFLA, and the Care Center Network. Will these kind of comparisons continue with help with future spread of ideas? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> I hope that, um, and uh, you know, I hope that that, 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 that demonstrates that that we we've, we've had an impact, and and that and you know, all the tools, as as has been mentioned, you know, we're creating a change package, toolkits, and all that other stuff, so that so that again, hopefully, it'll be accessible to to uh, any um, uh, any other centers that want to 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 work on this uh, um, in, in their at their own center. And uh, kind of a question as we're wrapping up is what, what's our future? What's our future iLabs? And uh, it may be an iLab, it may be a local effort, but uh, we're trying to get stratified data. We're trying to do our work through the lens of equity. So um, uh, Lucretia Thomas and Aaron Dawson, our quality improvement consultants are developing a tool that our local teams can look at their stratified data by race, uh, language, and ethnicity. As you heard today, though, you really have to understand how that data was captured. Um, and, and usually we want self-identified data, not 
physician interpreted or nurse interpreted data. We want self-identified data. So we have to learn all about that, but we wanna see if there are inequities and we have some preliminary data that there are inequities between um, blacks and other people of color uh, with outcomes in their in their health. Um, and our team reviewed the Hispanic data for the Western United States. Lung function is 10% less um, than whites. So we, are, you know, that may be where our local teams are going and our network is going. What change ideas, what interventions, what measures can we do as a network to change those outcomes? So um, did you want to comment on that, Breck? I know our time's running out, so I'll just say quickly, yeah, I think I think that is where we're going. And I know with the Health Related Quality of Life I Lab, which uh, Jordan and I are working on, uh, we know we've got a, a ways to go on that as well. We're just learning about uh, first was, you know, can we capture it? And then does it have any value? And then what do you do to change it? So uh, we'll be working on that for some time. And other social determinants of health are a priority, as well as trust that has come up. And can we QI trust? Can we have a change idea how to build trust amongst our patients and families and teams? So that's a real important time. And it looks like we're winding up and it's 2.15 West Coast, 5.15 East Coast. Thank you, everyone. Amazing. And uh, we have such a great community here. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.